Welcome back to the Pastor Study. I'm Pastor Seth. This is my wife, Jennifer. Hello. And today we are moving into chapter two of our study of Sola Scriptura. This chapter is about authority. Well, quick summary. The chapter itself is about human authorities that have vied with Scripture in people's lives since the Reformation. Namely, the Enlightenment and then liberal Protestantism. <laughs> So, in summary, what authority is over your life? For the re early reformers and for the vast majority of the church, mm -hmm. God is our authority. And one way we understand God's authority is by what is written in Scripture. And so, because of God's authority, we view Bible as authoritative. However, throughout history, well, I'll just... <laughs> the devil d doesn't like that. And so he comes up with excuses to why God's authority isn't enough. Or isn't good enough. Or is completely erroneous. Why would you want that? So, in the Reformation, there was scripture plus the church government. Yep. And in reality, it was church government and you don't have to worry about scripture. Or church government gets to use scripture. Yeah. So who has the authority to read scripture, who has the authority to interpret scripture, who has the authority to impose what scripture says on other people? That was a big part of what the Reformation was about. Following the Reformation, we get into the Enlightenment modern era, mm -hmm. where people didn't like the fact that God is an authority in our lives. We <laughs> want human reason to be our authority. Or human experience, or... Yeah. And so the majority of the book is outlining the different um, arguments and attacks on Scripture's authority in the lives of human beings. But attacks on God's authority are not new to the later modern era. Mm -hmm. I, you could see the Garden of Eden when the snake first approaches Eve as an attack on God's authority. Scripture wasn't written at that point, but she had a word from God, and the devil tried to undermine it. Devil did undermine it. He did undermine it. She bought, the, she bought the bait. Excuse me. To clarify, the devil undermined Adam and Eve's view of God's authority. Their faith in God's yeah. authority. Because authority doesn't just mean the strength to say something. It also means the trust, the trustworthiness of the thing said. And God, we believe, we have seen, is very trustworthy. And that's the and what we saw or what we see in the Garden of Eden is the pattern that gets repeated throughout history, from generation to generation. Each generation of people trying to create a new authority that isn't God. That's what sin and Satan want. They want people to not trust God's authority. Reading through First and Second Kings right now, and. God's authority? Or the authority of that God that lives in the neighborhood next to me? Is a big question for a lot of these people. Who am I going to trust to bring prosperity to my people? Seems to be the thing that the kings have to grapple with. Mm -hmm. And whether or not they come out on the right side of that determines what kind of rule they have. And so following behind authority is mm -hmm. where do you put your trust? Where do you put your faith? It's very easy to put our trust and faith in ourselves mm. because we like to think we can control ourselves. In reality, we, we don't do a very good job of controlling ourselves. Just <laughs> look at how many bad habits we have in our lives <laughs> and just how prevalent various addictions are in the world. Going back these last 300 years or so, you'll see that most of these philosophies want to make man the stamp of approval on something. Um, but you also see that each time we make some part of our personality the stamp of approval, be it our reason, or our exalted emotions, or our experience, or our moral decision, we fail pretty badly. Because we aren't capable of understanding the whole problem, whatever it is that we are dealing with, of addressing the whole problem and the problem is really us. Mm -hmm. It's not a coincidence that the two biggest, most destructive wars that have happened in human history 
happened when we be believed most in ourselves when we believe most in ourselves uh, the early 20th century uh, modernism what is, was at its height and everybody believed that human reason was enough to determine God's will or in some cases was better than God's will and all these high minded individuals who thought they had perfected morality unleashed the greatest horrors known to man and did it on purpose in some of those instances they called it the great war the war to end all wars and in reality it was just the first of a series of horrible tra to say tragedies just puts it can you have a pan tragedy a pan tra yeah <laughs> World War One to World War Two and the Holocaust Roll it and, forward and on it goes. Uh, the various cultural purges that happened in Russia and China and anyway, slightly <laughs> getting off topic. The point is authority. The only authority in our lives that is actually going to lead us to a good and happy life is God's authority. Very true. But like I said, who are we going to trust? Who are we going to put our faith in? very easy to put it on ourselves or into technology or maybe into this great leader that is in our country and I, and I say our country I'm talking in a general sense everybody does this so this gets back to what how do you see the world how do you understand what is your understanding of how the world works we have a word for this worldview you yeah. might have probably have heard it used quite a bit yes uh, a worldview is basically the structure of your world, the things that you take for granted when you start reasoning. We'll throw some of the people in a book we read, the, book, the chapter under the bus. The Enlightenment thinkers took for granted that human reason was infallible. If you could think at a certain level, you were a fitting judge for everything else in the world. Now, that they could not prove, but they took it for granted that that was They took the it on faith. Yeah, they believed it. If they actually apply their own principles to their own worldview, they would realize that they were living by faith. Yeah, and they wouldn't have liked yep. it. And in this situation, when we are elevating human reason to such a high level, then that becomes a standard of what a human is. And you can probably quickly see how, how this can turn into something that's very evil. Be people who are smarter, become, more, become more human if somebody had uh, say had um and now my tongue has just turned off but a mental deficiency to quote to use yeah. old terms yeah. uh we'll just say if i had if i had a stroke tonight oh. and tomorrow morning i woke up with only half my brain working that worldview would see me as being half a human and 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 this mindset led to some governments purging, purging such people. Mm -hmm. um, so what, wherever, whenever your focus shifts away from Jesus and the triune God, we humans start making very, very gross errors, committing gross acts of violence. Basically, in that case, we are made in the image of God, but suddenly we've elevated ourselves to God, so everything has to be made in our image, whether it be highly rational or sublimely yep. emotional or whatever. So now we're bringing it back to Scripture, because yep. that's what this book is about, <laughs> Sola Scriptura, and why is Scripture alone? And I like to reiterate that we're talking about Scripture alone is different than Scripture only. All by itself. Scripture all by itself, yes. To better highlight this point, mm -hmm. imagine that you are one of the first disciples to follow Jesus. Ooh. In your life, how often did, has God's word come to you? Actually, a number of times. As a faithful Jew, you were born into a society that already had God's word, had holy scriptures. Yes. It's what we call the Old Testament, but if you were alive back then, you would just say, it's, whole, it's God's word. It's scripture. So you were born. So that's one. Two, when Jesus starts walking around, 
he's God's word made flesh. He, God's word has come to you. And when Jesus breathes on you and says, receive my spirit, that's the third time that God's word has come to you. At Pentecost, that would be the fourth time that God's word has come to you. And this time in the form of the Holy Spirit. So at least for, let's say, Peter and the twelve disciples, we have four distinct times when God's word came to them in four different mediums. mediums. A written word, a physical human being, breath, and the fire of the Holy Spirit. As Christians today, how often do we receive God's holy word? Every Sunday. <laughs> Every Sunday. So right off the bat, we still have holy scriptures. That's one. If you are hearing the word preached on Sunday or some other day of the week, you are getting it from a living, breathing human being. So? That's two. That's two. Through baptism. God's word comes to us in our baptism. And when we celebrate Holy Communion. That's another time we receive God's word. What about moments of inspiration or direction? I am currently talking about the ordinary means right. of receiving God's word. Fair enough. And by ordinary, I mean these are common to everyone all the time. There are extraordinary methods of receiving God's word. For example, the burning bush. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, there's only one of those. There, there's only one account of that. <laughs> I don't expect a burning bush, you know, God's word to come to you in a burning bush because as far as we know, that only happened with Moses. Mm -hmm. um, slight, a more common form of extraordinary would be dreams. Mm. I have not received any dreams from God, nothing that I would claim to be a word from God in my dreams, but it happens. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be a, a Christian for it to happen. No. <clears throat> Joseph and Pharaoh, um, Daniel, twice. Um, went to the emperors of Persia and Babylon to interpret yep. dreams and modern missionaries have recounted that the people they went to were prepared for their arrival by dreams mm -hmm. so so <laughs> bringing this back to scripture because <laughs> what I wanted to show is that there are a variety of way that God gives us his word mm -hmm. Holy Scripture our Bible is the most common ordinary way not that it's ordinary and like, uh, we no. can forget about it, but we have about four or five, at least, Bibles, <coughs> excuse me, in our house. And on our phones. And here in church, there are hundreds, maybe even a thousand, I don't know. There are a lot of Bibles here. Mm -hmm. It's highly accessible in the sense that most people can get their hands on some part of it mm -hmm. if they need to. So the Bible is one way that God's authority is revealed in our lives. And that's what we mean about sola scriptura versus nuda scriptura, to use the Latin. Scripture alone versus only scripture. So because when we say scripture alone, we're saying God alone is our authority in our life. Right. And because God is our only authority in our life, we look to the Bible for direction and we don't look for well we look to the Bible as our ordinary method the method that we're gonna go to first and most often to understand God's authority and will for our lives let me take a stab at this too. okay when people say new to scripture which means basically I only take what is directly written on these pages and nothing else they're separating what's in the Bible from its historical context and also from the way it works has worked out over the last four or five thousand years in people's lives. That requires a whole different kind of interpretation than the church has used traditionally. We don't want to pitch all the tradition and understanding and historical understanding. Like, Understanding how kingship works helps us understand what sort of person David was and what sort of person the Jews were looking for in David's son. Yeah. That's historical information that's not in the Bible, but we need that to understand why they were so startled when Jesus was what he was <laughs> and is. And also to understand how Jesus is the perfect king. Because as good as David was, he did some doozies. 
And <laughs> Solomon yeah. was great, but he went off the cliff. Yeah. And from and those were the two good ones, and it just kind of descended in a spiral from there. With because some, of authority and yep, such. Who's authority? But my point being that we don't want to script to strip scripture of the things that rightfully belong with it. We want to understand scripture in its context to get more out of it. Yeah. Sola Scriptura puts scripture on that kind of a pedestal. Yes. And so Sola Scriptura is taking the Bible, well, treating it honestly and respectfully. Yes. How does the Bible talk about itself? How does the Bible teach us how to use it in our lives? So, I just lost my train of thought here. <laughs> well, shall I throw a few things out while you gather it, or have uh, sure. you got it back? A few things that people will say to undermine the authority of Scripture is um, just point by point. Um, well, I have a word from God, and it says otherwise. No, God never contradicts himself. You might have a word from the Lord. The Holy Spirit is very active but it will be compatible with scripture or else well scripture has been tested and your word hasn't therefore we'll go with scripture so yeah that's a good segue go for segue it. my so as we get into authority the authorities that we any authority that's not god in our lives mm -hmm. is will try to blind us from from god so, what I mean by that is that when we come up with ways of interpreting the Bible that are apart from the Bible, um, using it back to the Enlightenment, since they had a belief that miracles didn't exist, they just immediately discounted all the stories about miracles. So, like half the Bible. <laughs> so, if you kind of think about it, a rational person will try to gather as much evidence as they can and then come to the conclusion right but they didn't do that what they did is they came to the conclusion and then got rid of all the evidence that would contradict them they wanted something in the bible that made them comfortable so i'm using the enlightenment and modern uh, people who use modern thinking as kind of um a whipping boy right now but this also happens <laughs> in the church <laughs> if you have an understanding of how God works you're gonna look at the parts of the Bible that confirm that right. and then ignore all those parts in the Bible that seem to contradict you for example when was the last time you opened the minor prophets <laughs> <laughs> well I, I not really think of any way that the minor prophets contradict anything but um, everybody does this so, as an example, I fully believe in um, limited atonement. All right. And yet there are verses in the Bible where it says that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for the entire world. Or God is not willing that any should be lost. How, I mean, that I think, seems to imply that limited atonement is wrong. And yet there are verses in the Bible that say, no, some people will be judged and will suffer eternal fire. And that God even chooses some to be saved and some not to be saved. And what's particularly frustrating is that sometimes these verses are right next to each other. <laughs> I am uh, here in Chandler. I am doing a series on 1 John. And in 1 John chapter 2, John both says that one, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for the entire world. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to say, people who don't follow Jesus are in darkness. And If you are in darkness, there is no light in you. So, we have to balance these two seemingly opposite points of view, understandings, in order to help us maintain our own honesty, our own humility before God. I am not an authority over God. God is authority over me. And there will be times when I, as a limited human being, won't fully understand all of God's ways. And that's okay. Because the Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. By Christ alone. And 
That's enough for me. It's the only way it ever could be. It's the only way it could be. So as we've gone through this chapter, or if you were reading this chapter along with us, it's very easy to lose sight of the fact that this chapter is about understanding that God is our authority. Because mm -hmm. there is a plenty of examples of attacks on it. And he does a very wonderful job of summarizing about 400 years of human history. And it's really just limited to European history, though he does get a little bit into America. Um, but it's a fantastic example of just how, you know, humans are still pretty depraved and we want it our way. And it's really hard for us to surrender our will to God. Thankfully, God is faithful. Mm, amen. Thankfully, God has given us his word. And because of Holy Scripture, we have it written out in black and white. Very important. And if anybody who goes to it faithfully and honestly and with humility, they will understand the main point of what the Bible is telling us. Plenty of chapters or even entire books of the Bible are confusing and they don't make sense to us because we're living in 21st century America and not, say, in 500 BC Palestine. However, like I said, still God's word, it's a living word. And it has something to say to us even today. Even though it might have first been written many centuries or even millennia ago. You can't say that about other other works that were written during those times. Um, even though we have copies of Aristotle, most people aren't Aristotelian in their thinking. It's kind of this historical... He was want, there. Yep, historical fact. And if you like history and learning philosophy. about philosophy of once upon a time, you, you go read Aristotle. But as for the most part, nobody reads Aristotle or Plato or any of those Think about the great religions that were around the Jews. Nobody's worshipping Dagon or Baal anymore. Or uh, any of the Roman the, gods. Yep. I mean, the Roman pantheon, forward. Persian, Egyptian, all these things have passed away. And yet, the Bible, God's word, is still intact. And we found copies of it from 2000, some bits and pieces even going back 2,500 years ago, and it hasn't changed. It hasn't that changed. That is amazing. One of the things the chapter brought up when people were attacking scripture is they tried to attack its historical basis. you got to remember, they were speaking from the 16, 17 hundreds. These days we have so much more information. Mm -hmm. Archaeology has uncovered so much regarding the roots of our Bible. The Bible is amazingly sustained. Uh, there are extant copies of scripture from the first century A.D. of, of the Gospels, mm -hmm. I should say. Like, that's within 50 years of being, being written. That's incredible. Slightly getting off track. Yeah, a little. But one of the attacks on the authority of scripture is that, oh, errors have happened over the ways. And they might mention that there are a certain, a big number of errors. What they don't tell you is that the vast majority of the, those errors, errors are one manuscript will say Jesus Christ, and another manuscript will say Christ Jesus. Oh my! So, it's not really an error. <laughs> it's just flipping the word order. It doesn't change the meaning or anything like that. It's not even a punctuation error. <laughs> it's, so, if you hear things like that, just... Don't let it damage your faith. Realize that most of these errors are very small, inconsequential, and usually revolve around a certain word order of Jesus' name. Really? That many of them are on that? Well, I don't have the numbers right in front of me or off the top of my head, but a significant <sighs> chunk are often Jesus Christ versus Christ Jesus. Any more points to bring up from... Any more points to bring up? 
Odds are you're going to encounter some sort of attack on the authority of scripture in your life. A well-meaning friend, co-worker, maybe even your own personal doubts. Uh, two thoughts to that. One, what's the alternative? Because every human system has failed, and history proves that, and nobody can really argue with it. Two, don't give up on scripture just because you get frustrated. It is authoritative. It takes time and energy and discipline to learn to work with authority. Mm -hmm. uh, scripture is a marvelous book with depth and resonance. And the deeper you get into it, the more you will appreciate and understand it. The longer you work with it, the more it will tell you. And since this is sola scriptura, how does the Bible teach us to approach it? Well, as you said, consistently, mm -hmm. over and over again, patiently, prayerfully, and in community. You don't have to solve it all by yourself. You have a church body, a family around you. Many people who go to school and spend <laughs> a lot of their life reading it over and over and over again. And it's as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And that deepens our understanding of Scripture. Amen. As a final story <laughs> about authority and written words, I'd like to use an example from when I was in the Navy. Mm. There was a certain three-ring binder in the engine room called the Engineer Standing Orders. These were a list of orders and ways of doing things that how our engineer wanted us to do certain jobs and behave in certain ways when in the he engine wasn't room. Around. When he wasn't around. Right. These are orders that are always in effect. Now, that three ring binder wasn't the authority. No. The engineer was the authority. And in fact, there were authorities over him. The captain was authority over the engineer. The Navy was an authority over the captain. President of the United States is authority, and so on and so on. On another tan angle, the engineer's education was an authority speaking through the engineer. All of that filtered down into this three-ring binder. In and of itself, it wasn't the authority, but it was how we understood what the will of authority was. And if someone was like, I think we should do it this way, you could point to the three-ring binder and say, no, yeah. the inge said to do it this way. <laughs> but the engineer was a fallible human being. Some of his orders didn't work. <laughs> Uh-oh. But there was, but we knew what to do. If the, if the orders the engineer gave us, let's say that there was, um, we had a machine that would filter salt water and produce fresh water. If the engineer's orders on how to operate this machine didn't work, well, we came up with a workaround. The correct way to do that is figure out the right way of doing it, then go talk to the engineer, and the engineer would change his orders to reflect the proper way of doing it. <laughs> the wrong way is to not tell anybody, keep it to yourself, and just kind of do what you thought. Anyway, so the point is, is that he, the the engineer's standing orders is an example of human authority. It was fallible. It had to be changed from time to time when better ways of doing things came around. Our, our physical Bibles are a representation of God's authority in our lives, or mm -hmm. a communication of God's authority to our lives. Well, God's authority is perfect. It doesn't mm -hmm. need to be changed. Mm -hmm. However, our understanding of God's Word often does need to be changed. Our understanding of Scripture is not our authority. God's authority is our authority. And we must always approach the Bible with a bit of fear and trembling. Again, words from the Bible. Because we shouldn't be too sure of what we're going to read. Of, of what we're going to read. But we know what we're going to read. The Bible is going to convict us convict us of our sins, call us to repent, give us hope, and fill us with faith, hope, and love so that we can do
God's will. We can follow God's law. And any reading of the Bible that isn't following that pattern, you can safely discount as a faulty reading of the Bible. Well, with that said, with that said, let us go before God, knowing that He hears us and welcomes us. Will you join us in prayer? Holy Father, Holy Son, and Holy Ghost, I thank you for the gift of your word. I thank you for the book that we call the Bible. I thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that helps us understand and put what we read into practice. I thank you for your Son who you sent to earth, who perfectly fulfilled your word, for he is your word made flesh. I thank you for the sacrifice he made and that we are washed and he has made atonement for us. I thank you that you've raised Jesus from the dead and now he is our authority for Jesus sits on the throne of heaven. I thank you, Jesus, for being our Lord, that you are faithful, and that you give us faith, hope, and love. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us even when we go off the rails. So I pray that you will bless this world. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll move around this world, bringing the light of Jesus to everyone, everywhere. And so we pray for our schools and our businesses. We pray for our government, our police officers and firefighters. We pray for those in the military. We pray for our farmers who are getting ready for planting. We pray for our farmers that take care of livestock and cattle. I pray, Lord, for our churches. I pray that you will heal our hearts. Teach us to be faithful to your word. And I pray that your word will be on our lips. Our Lord Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace, the Great Physician. These past couple days, many people here in Chandler have gone to the hospital. Lord, you know their needs, and I pray that you'll provide healing in their lives. I thank you that we have doctors and nurses and hospitals where we can go and receive healing. Thank you that these places exist. Lord, I know that none of our efforts will be successful if you are not first in them. So I pray that you'll give skill and wisdom to our doctors and nurses, and that as they do the best they can with their craft, that your spirit will heal the bodies so that their work will be fruitful, and that our brothers and sisters will be without pain and can join in their daily activities with all of us. Lord, I pray for teachers and students as the end of the year approaches and uh, both get antsy and tired. Uh, give them energy, give them patience, give them curiosity and a desire to learn. Ask you to bless our administrators and teachers and school staff who have been through a very rough year this year negotiating so many new regulations and requirements and needs. Um, to deal with our changing situations. Bless them with peace and with perseverance and resilience and a desire to keep going. Ask your blessing on our leaders. They have a lot of tough decisions to make. Uh, give them good information, wise advisors, strong constitutions, and uh, peace in their families. And so we pray, as Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters. Amen.